Today's episode is about blockchain and the possibilities that it offers for the future of contracting. In today's interconnected, always on environment, where news of important events that have taken place and the views of decision makers and opinion influencers about them can be broadcast for the markets and world at large to hear within a matter of minutes. It is easy to forget how dependent we all are on this. Yes, it is a piece of paper, but it is more than that. It is a record. It could be a record of a birth, death, or marriage, someone's hiring or firing, or even an executive order. It could be a credit card transaction receipt, a balance sheet of a company's assets and debts, or a court order. It could be a copy of an agreement signed between two people to buy or sell a house, or a treaty between two countries. But without records, and more importantly, without people we trust to make these records correctly and to hold them securely, we would have no reliable evidence that any event or transaction has ever taken place. Most of our economy works by having each party maintain its own copy of records or ledgers of transactions, whether that is money coming in and going out, assets acquired and sold, or agreements entered into. A company keeps financial records for its auditors to use to prepare its accounts, which are then filed with government authorities. Banks keep records of the transactions made between them on behalf of their clients. Insureds keep a log of their policies, and so do their insurers. There's a lot of cost in this process because work is duplicated and because expense is often incurred quibbling about the truth to resolve discrepancies. Also, sometimes parties manipulate their records for their own ends. One solution has been the trusted third party, who maintains a single ledger for a group. But there are many important functions where there is no such trusted third party, or the trusted third party takes a substantial slice. Blockchain is another solution. A blockchain is a shared distributed ledger. Every participant runs a copy of the software and has a copy of the entire ledger. Some blockchains are open and anonymous and others are closed and permissioned. Bitcoin is an example of a cryptocurrency based on an open and anonymous blockchain. Business blockchains are usually closed, that is limited to invited members and permissioned. A shared ledger offers enormous benefits. You avoid the duplicate costs of having every participant maintain its own ledger. And you have a single source of truth for resolving disputes. What distinguishes blockchain from other distributed ledger technologies is the security features. For example, users can enter data only with cryptographic keys, which are said to be unbreakable, at least, some say, until quantum computers become available. Nothing is overwritten, and instead all changes are added to the ledger in what are called blocks. No block is added to the ledger without a level of consensus among the nodes, who are participants supporting the blockchain. Each block contains a hash value of the prior blocks, so a change to any prior block would be easily detected as a break in the hash value chain. So far, people believe that no blockchain has been hacked, so a blockchain is considered to be a possible solution to the plague of cyber attacks. The fact that the blockchain is distributed is critical. Let's compare it to a situation which uses a trusted third party, such as a clearinghouse. Like a blockchain, a clearinghouse maintains a shared ledger and should make only those changes approved by the parties. The key difference is that a clearinghouse maintains the master database and controls the changes. So, you have a single point of control and a single point of failure, and everyone needs to trust the people who run the clearinghouse, and they need to pay the clearinghouse. So, there's potentially a lot of risk and costs there. With a blockchain, there is no single point of control, no single point of failure, no need to trust anyone and no one who can use their position to command high fees. 
That's great, of course, from a technical and business viewpoint. In fact, the first blockchain application was Bitcoin, which people created when the financial crisis exposed the flaws in trusting even the biggest names, like Lehman Brothers. A final term that you may have heard in relation to blockchain is the adoption of smart contracts. Well, clearly no lawyer was involved in giving it that name. A smart contract is not a contract and it is not smart compared to the common law. Instead, a smart contract is code that runs on a blockchain and operates automatically. A common example is what's called parametric insurance. You sign up on the blockchain for insurance that pays out based on some event occurring, such as wind speeds that would indicate a Category 4 hurricane. Then, if the weather service spots those wind speeds, payment is made automatically. You don't need to trust the insurance company will pay the claim or even wait for payment. People are working to construct smart contracts in numerous business applications. For example, let's say that you are shipping to a destination with no effective legal system, to a buyer who doesn't trust you enough to pay in advance or set up letter of credit. You could have payment triggered automatically by a smart contract if a radio transmitter in the shipment sends a signal from the delivery location. From a legal perspective, there are challenges with both the blockchain technology and the idea of adopting smart contracts. Let's start with the technology. Most blockchain technologies developed for financial services have been created by different players in the industry coming together to design them. But agreeing who will own and who will be able to exploit the developed technology is critical to the success of any initiative. While blockchain and similar technologies may be built on open source software by its creators as part of a foundational consortium, which allow users to quickly and freely develop code, provided they do so in accordance with the license requirements, these consortia will frequently require these members to contribute their own software materials and know-how to the project. As a result, complex and thorough negotiations have to take place to agree the basis under which each member can use each other's intellectual property and confidential information for the purposes of running the consortium and the projects, as well as the terms under which the technology that is contributed or developed will be owned and can be used by the participants. Otherwise, consortium members risk losing control over their own intellectual property, with rivals potentially able to use it and develop, monopolize, and exploit the technology created from it to the detriment of the contributing members and ultimately the success of the initiative itself. Secondly, there are risks associated with what happens if the blockchain technology does not work as it should or results in your business receiving an intellectual property infringement claim because it incorporates copied technology. Where the technology has been created by a foundation or a consortium, there are typically very limited protections to fall back on to seek redress from those other parties that provided or developed the copied or defective technology. Finally, the regulatory environment that many industry players are hoping to deploy blockchain technology in are all designed to regulate companies and people, rather than regulating distributed software and databases. Banks and other financial institutions cannot outsource their responsibilities and must ensure that the technological solution that they may adopt are suited to the laws and regulations to which they are subject. This will be a huge challenge going forward when adopting blockchain-based technologies. There are also a number of challenges with the adoption and use of smart contracts. As I mentioned, the possibility of self-executing contracts is appealing to many types of businesses. But consider this, many businesses also benefit from the inefficiencies that exist when complying with contracts. Some businesses will routinely rely on being able to pay slightly late in non-compliance with their contracts in order to manage their cash flow. Some companies may choose to interpret their obligations under a contract differently and may have in fact relied on a number of grey areas to get themselves comfortable with entering into it in the first place. And in some rare cases, businesses may actually decide not to comply at all, despite knowing that these actions will be in breach of the contract just in order to exert some pressure on the other party for different reasons, perhaps in connection with a different part of the relationship that isn't working so well. 
all of these common commercial practices would not be possible under a self-executing, perhaps less than smart contract. Secondly, there is the question of how you enable the parties to update the smart contract to account for any changes in the law in the absence of a trusted third party to intervene, adjudicate, and make the corresponding changes to the code of the smart contract. Whilst an industry utility that is run by a trusted third party might just update the terms of use centrally, there may not be an equivalent entity that can do this, or the parties would want to do that, in relation to smart contracts. Finally, there is also the question of how you allow individuals to enforce their rights. Imagine a smart contract with or about consumers. For example, it is important to recognise that individuals may have a right to privacy under the laws of different countries, such as the right to object to the distribution of information about them, to have irrelevant, inaccurate or excessive information recorded about them deleted, which may restrict the ability of market participants to store, share and edit that information. Working out how smart contracts or the underlying blockchain can be edited to respond to the exercise of these rights will be important. So, while there are many potential benefits of using blockchain technologies, there are also a number of strategic and legal challenges which businesses developing and implementing them will need to overcome in order to adopt blockchain-based technologies successfully in the future.